Hi, this is Tracy Tagama Spinoza, and this is week six on theories of how humans learn. We'll look at this in a chronological perspective, beginning with the philosophical basis of learning theories, and then move on to traditional theories of learning that have been around for a couple of decades, and then propose some new learning theories that have only been present for a couple of years. And throughout, we want to challenge you to consider your own theory of learning based on the different pieces that we have here. We'd like you to piece together the different parts of different learning theories and make your own sense of how humans learn and propose this at the end of the class. So if we begin with the philosophical basis of learning theories, we're going to use uh, Darling Hammond and colleagues' work in which uh, she summarizes the perspective of the Greeks as basically trying to answer this question. Is truth and knowledge to be found within us, which is rationalism, or is it to be found outside of ourselves by using our senses, which is empiricism? And we're going to do this by beginning with this main concept that philosophy, the actual word, means love of wisdom, right? And the three main Greeks that we're going to look at are Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Socrates, in order to answer this question, believed that knowledge comes through dialogue. And this is the basis of the Socratic method, you know, never tell what you can ask. And he also thought that wisdom was limited to an awareness of one's own ignorance. I only know that I know nothing. So part of understanding or part of learning has to do with being able to tap into what it is that we don't already know. Being able to identify the gaps in our own knowledge will help us point to what it is that we do need to know. He's also attributed with saying the unexamined life is not worth living. And to using a metaphor for teaching, which is the midwife. His own mother was a midwife. And, and the thought here is that, you know, you have everything you need to know inside of you. You have the knowledge. It's within you. So my job as a teacher is just to help you, help facilitate, get that out of you. Finally, he's attributed with the saying that uh, strong minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, weak minds discuss people. And this goes to show the elevated level of discussion that Socrates liked to conduct. Plato was Socrates' prized student, and he was a rationalist. He believed that knowledge comes from self-reflection. He founded the Academy, and he's attributed with saying that wonder is the feeling of a philosopher, and philosophy begins in wonder. So beginning with the approach that all new learning is grounded in the idea that you should have wonder and awe at the world. All new things can be looked at or approached from with this lens of newness, of, of understanding, of trying to understand things from different perspectives. And about education, he said, if you ask what is the good of education in general, the answer is easy. The education makes good men and that good men act nobly. So the idea is that education not only serves the individual for his own self-betterment, but it also meant that people would then behave better as citizens. And Plato is also attributed with um, promoting the golden rule before the golden rule even existed. No, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And he's also attributed with the idea that necessity is the mother of invention. So people are pushed by their environments, the problems that they might contemplate, and how they would resolve those problems is part of new learning. And he welcomed challenges. Uh, he said that if there is no contradictory impression, there is nothing to awaken reflection. So learning comes from self-reflection in Plato's eyes. Then we have the perspective of Aristotle, and he was Plato's prize student. He believed that knowledge comes through the senses. Remember, we spoke about this when we talked about sensory perception and how the brain receives new information. This concept has been around since Aristotle, and he would be probably surprised to see that uh, it has been proven now through neuroimaging techniques. How all new learning is perceived through the senses is reviewed for prior knowledge. And so Aristotle was Plato's prize student, and he was an empiricist, and he believed that we receive information through the senses, those senses are perceived in our brain, and therefore we can construct knowledge based on that information that we receive through the senses. He founded the Lyceum, the School of Philosophy. And what many don't know is that he actually wrote one of the first books, uh, Psychology, about a psyche in Greek or de anima in Latin. The Romans differed a little bit from the Greeks in that they believed that there was a very um, utilitarian aspect to education. People should be educated because then they would be better citizens or they, would, um, they could serve society better. So there was a great emphasis or a different emphasis on voc vocational training that came from the Roman influence on, in education. And when we think about the first universities in the world, many people would think that, oh, okay, we, we consider Bologna, which was the first uh, university that was founded by the Roman Catholic Church and the, the monasteries. But actually, the Islamic tradition predates the Catholic Church in the founding of universities. There's one in uh, Tunisia that claims to be the oldest university, according to UNESCO. There's a kind of a fight going on with um, another university in Morocco, founded in 959 AD, that also says that it's the first university in the world. Um, but it has to do with basically what was offered, what types 
types of um, content uh, knowledge were offered. But both the Islamic tradition as well as the Christian tradition were pretty much transmission-based learning. There was a lot of memoristic instruction that occurred, a lot of uh, transcribing of scriptures. And from these institutions come uh, the root of these words, you know, prophet and professor, so the person from on high passing on information to the rest of us. And if we move forward in history, move into the Renaissance, and in the 15th uh, to the 17th century, there was a new consideration, uh, Renaissance or rebirth, of uh, this concept of liberal education to free the individual, to free him from ignorance. He would be taught um, a variety of different things. So freedom of thought was prized, and this was very much in a, in a human-centric vision of education. So Protagoras said that man is the measure of all things. So this is a big shift from the, from the Grecian and Roman models, which were very much that the gods were the center of the world. Well, now we have uh, humans in the center of the world. And so humanist education was based on what we now know as the, the humanities, but the, the original five areas of studies were poetry, grammar, history, moral philosophy, and rhetoric. And this was the time of some really great minds of Shakespeare, Cervantes, Christopher Wren, Copernicus, Galileo, Descartes, Descartes who said, I think, therefore I am. So this big centrist view on humans and human mind, the human mind and how it grows based on new input from different sources. This was also a time when we began to have, albeit illegal drawings of the human brain, you know, from illegal autopsies that occurred at the time. And moving on from the Renaissance into the Enlightenment time in the 18th century, these were very big changing times for humanity, you know. This is the time of the independence of France, of the United States, this big concept of liberty, progress, reason, tolerance, fraternity. And it was a, there was a focus on ending the abuses of the church and state and the separation of powers and, a, and offering a social contract with the people. So appreciating individuals as members of a, of a society that would actually benefit all. So not just education for an individual's growth, but how could people contribute to their societies. This was the start of capitalism as well as the Industrial Revolution. First scientific journals were published in French, English, German, and Dutch. And French became the lingua franca, replacing Latin. And this was also the time of the first encyclopedic dictionaries that were available to the common man. So it wasn't just that information was locked up in the churches anymore, but they were available, open and available to different people. And this was also the time of the tree of knowledge, which was fascinating. It's fascinating to me that, so at the time there was this concept that there were three main branches of human knowledge, which stem from memory, reason, and imagination, um, and the trunk of which is, is philosophy. Philosophy was sort of the basis for all of these different pieces of, for all of new learning, but from that, with, to construct new learning, you had to have memory, reason, and imagination. Enlightenment was also the time of Jean Locke, who believed, if you recall, in this concept of a uh, tabula rasa, or just this blank slate. So. Human babies were born into the world with nothing, and they were an empty vessel. And what did we have to do as educators is fill that vessel? But he did gave a lot of stock to education. He said, I think I may say that of all the men we meet with, nine parts of ten are what they are, good or evil, useful or not, by their education. So he put a great deal of stock into the quality of education that one receives. And the, as we are born with a blank slate, the way you are formed is really who you are going to be. There is nothing really there attributed to genetic inheritance. Enlightenment was also the time of Rousseau. Rousseau also very much a highly valued education. He said, we're born weak, we need strength. Helpness, we need aid. Foolish, we need reason. All that we lack at birth, all that we need when we come to man's estate is the gift of education. So he really put a lot of stock in the value of a good education. And he's really well known as being one of the first philosophers to suggest that education should be shaped to the child. That is, child-centric education for the first time was mentioned in the literature. And he also was a precursor to a certain level of constructivism. He said, through life experiences, complex ideas are built from simple ideas that are gathered from the world around them. So you perceive information from your outside world and you build from lower level concepts to higher level concepts. And he wrote a book called Emile, or translated into uh, On Education, which was a treatise on the education of the whole person for citizenship. So this was also one of these first books to to look at a holistic view of the formation of the individual. This book was actually banned uh, throughout Europe. <laughs> and he believed that humans are born imperfect, but there's an innate perfectibility of man. That is, that you are born with a great need to be shaped and formed by the education you can receive. He also believed that, yes, you know, humans are born imperfect, but there exists an innate perfectibility 
of man. That is that individuals have the potential inside of them to become better or to become well-formed so long as they have good education. Having said that about the individual, he didn't think much of society. He believed that society corrupts and the natural state of humans. So he didn't think so much about uh, society as he thought of the individual. You know, society corrupts the natural good state of an individual. And that the greater role of education would be to develop an individual's character and moral sense so that he can handle the unnatural society in which he'll have to live. He's also attributed as saying we should not teach children the sciences, but rather give them a taste for them. Meaning what? That we should um, permit uh, discovery learning. We should ignite the natural curiosity of individual children for different subject areas, but not push subjects on them. So again, back to this idea that education should be shaped to the child or to the individual interests. Enlightenment was also Emilia Kant's time, and Kant believed that it's through education that all the good in the world arises. So again, these three fellows from the Enlightenment really put a lot of stock into what good quality education could do for the state of man, and then therefore uh, in modifying society. So for Kant, education is a constant effort, a voluntary ascension, a progressive evolution towards an ideal. He's very much a rationalist in Plato's line of thinking, but he also had this very, very clever idea hundreds of years before it could be proven. But he suggested that a priori knowledge is something that you are born with. It's uh, present before the experience exists and uh, before contact with the outside world. It's innate in an individual and it influences our understanding of time and space. And that this a priori knowledge presupposes a basic structure upon which thinking process can develop. So it wasn't known at the time if he, was, he would have attributed this or he would use the same words that we use today. But basically, if you are born with a genetic predisposition for different things, so you're born with a priori knowledge and based on your contact with your environment, different genes can be turned on or not. And he also believed then that experience comes from our senses and the phenomenal world. So that's the philosophical basis of learning. Now let's look at some traditional theories of learning that exist. Um, and first let's, let's question ourselves. Where do educational theories come from? As we just mentioned, there's educational philosophy, so there's some theories of learning that come from the educational philosophy. There's other theories that come from educational psychology, and yet others that come from educational neuroscience. From this course, you might also look at different theories that are based on education itself, on mind, brain, health, if you look at the joint uh, collection of these visions, then you can look at things that are theories of motivation, for example, that go from the internal to the external, or you might look at how there are theories that are based on the balance or, or between the mind and the body, or how the environment or the social structures influence education. So you can categorize different learning theories in this way. You can also, based on what we did a couple of weeks back, look at you know ages versus stages versus experiences. There are theories of learning based on ages, for example, attachment theory in the early years, or andragogical learning, which has to do with uh, the difference between how adults learn versus how children learn. Or you can look at stages of learning, for example, remember uh, Piaget's cognitive stages of development. Or we can look at experience, and this has to do with something like, for example, expertise theory. So different theories can be categorized into these big groups. You can also look at theories of learning based on where we think the information about your world comes from. So there are theories that are related to the individual, you know, at a molecular structure, your genes, how your brain works. There's others that have to do with your mind, yet others that have to do with the influence of society or community, like for example, social learning theory, and yet others that have to do with a cultural historical perspective on learning. So right now we're gonna look at seven paradigms of how humans learn. We're gonna look at the humanist theories, behaviorist theories, cognitive theories, connectivist theories, design-based theorists, uh, 21st century skills and constructivist theorists. When we talk about humanist theorists, we consider things like emotional intelligence or experiential learning or Maslow's hierarchy of needs or positive psychology or self-determination. Um, emotional intelligence, as many of you know, is the capability of individuals to recognize their own and other people's emotions and to discriminate between different feelings and label them appropriately and then use emotional information to guide thinking and behavior. If you look at this in the grand sense, then it has to do with two different levels. One is myself and the other. The other construct has to do with being able to recognize things and then uh, regulate them. So uh, in the initial sense, an individual, a child, has to be able to recognize his or her own emotions. Uh, and then from that state, they would be able to then recognize those same emotional states in others. And then 
Additionally, that an individual has to not only identify and label his emotions, but be able to manage or control his emotional state, and then eventually be able to influence the emotional states of others. Here, the first time emotional intelligence was mentioned in the literature was by Beldach in 1964. Uh, Lerner has a lot of work in this area, pain. Um, but the first tests of emotional intelligence were developed by um, Salovey and Meyer, and then Probably the most famous publication comes from Daniel Goldman's book on emotional intelligence in 1995. Also within humanist theorists are experiential learning. This is learning through reflection and doing. So doing things in order to gain knowledge of the world. Sometimes we consider experiential learning to be the same thing as active learning or discovery learning or cooperative learning or service learning, free trace learning, adventure learning. And this really harkens back to the concept of Aristotle. So for the things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them, said Aristotle. Some of the main theorists in this area are Kolb, uh, Pfeiffer and Jones, Moon, and Jacobson and Rudy. Another humanist theory has to do with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is very interesting. Maslow suggested in 1943 that humans first had to deal with their physiological needs. If they haven't slept well, if they haven't eaten, if they don't have basic shelter, they won't be able to then have this level of safety or security and move on to having contact with others and love and feeling a sense of association. And then being able to uh, satisfy self-esteem needs to finally go into this higher level of self-actualization. What was very interesting about Maslow's theory, he never made this pyramid. Other people made the pyramid for him. But he basically believed that these are complex parallel processes. It's not that you have to meet one level of needing move up to the others. But what is clear is that you cannot reach um, higher levels without having the other level satisfied. But the idea is that some of these things have to be worked on in parallel. It's not that they just have to be it's sequential one after the other, but they can be parallel processes. Another human theory has to do with this new trend in positive psychology. It has many uh, different sub-areas, for example, flow or grit. These are key concepts that you might hear a lot about these days. But this goes from the idea of instead of looking at problems that individuals have and trying to get back up to zero, you know, a neutral level, positive psychology tries to maximize the potential that each individual has to the fullest. Not just getting back to zero, but trying to maximize the way that we can live our lives in the, in, with the best possible outcomes. Another humanist theory, which is a sub-area of positive psychology, has to do with flow. This really took the world by storm when it came up because it's actually a concept that was received well in the popular press as well as being researched by Mikhail, and I can't pronounce his last name, but he's a brilliant Hungarian man at Harvard University who laid out this idea that there are conditions under which flow exists. Flow is this mental state of operation in which a person performing activity is fully immersed in a feeling of energized focus, full involvement and enjoyment in the process. Uh, in essence, flow is characterized by complete absorption in what one does. Flow is also the, an idea of complete focused motivation. Um, some people call it hyper-focus, right? So how do you get there? And say it's easiest to describe this when you look at um, perhaps a musician who is improvising and just, you know, in, in the groove of things, right? Or somebody who's doing sports and they've just, you know, lost in this other level, in this other dimension. They don't realize how far they've run because they're just... In, in the moment, right? So um, the conditions under which flow exists, and uh, this is uh, charted by Kelly in 1997, where you know there is no flow if you are highly anxious or worried or, or you're just apathetic about your own situation. Uh, boredom, relaxation, none of those things lead to flow. But if you can have this perfect balance and where you can level out, which would be the difficulty level of the skill and the challenging level, in a way that it's, it's perceived as being something positive, attainable, and within one's grasp, so you're willing to devote time and energy to it. Somewhat related to um, flow, but definitely a sub-area of positive psychology, has to do with the concept of grit. Grit is basically perseverance, um, and this means that it's perseverance coupled with this passion uh, to keep at something, to work very hard, something that might not come very quickly, but that you're going to have to work at over time. Uh, grit is hardiness, resilience. So before the word resilience became so popular, people would talk about, you know, grit, giving it your best, you know, just being willing to redo, redo things if, you know, you failed the first time. Uh, ignore the negatives or at least make them secondary uh, and to take your time. The results of grit are only seen over time. So this isn't a short-term activity. This is uh, a way of being, a perspective, a mindset of how you approach challenges in your life.
What's very interesting is this is a non-cognitive trait, but they can have positive cognitive outcomes. And greed is seen to be the basis. It's based on passion for a particular long-term goal. And believe it or not, this was mentioned by William James in 1907, uh, the father of psychology, the big building in, in, in Harvard, uh, which is the basis of resilience. Finally, we have self-determination theory, which is a macro theory uh, for all human motivations, not just focused on kids, not just on adults, not just on Americans. It's meant to be considered as a global perspective on human needs and the way human needs lead to self-determination theory. So this is based on the choices that people make without external influences. So what do you do on your own independent of what others are doing to you to motivate you extrinsically? So this is generated by the basic needs, which are universal necessities, and these are innate, they're not learned, and they're seen in humanity across time, gender, and culture. Um, other big names in this field are Leper, Green, Nisbet, um, as well as uh, Desi and Ryan have many publications in this area. Now if we move on to the behaviorist theories, many of you have probably heard or can recall in your basic psychology classes about classical conditioning, operant conditioning and social learning theory, which are related to Pavlov, Skinner, and Bandura, respectively. Classical conditioning is also known as Pavlovian conditioning or respondent conditioning. And if you recall, this is the dog, right? Uh, the dog uh, sees the food, and the dog will naturally uh, salivate when he sees food. But then he's trained, and there's a bell that's rung, which is a neutral stimulus, and the bell shouldn't make a dog salivate, and indeed it doesn't. But then we combine the bell and the food, the dog will salivate. And then eventually the dog will simply salivate just because of the bell without the food. So Pavlov won the Nobel Prize in Physiology, not for this experiment, for something else. But So the basic idea is that classical conditioning occurs when a conditioned stimulus is paired with an unconditioned stimulus. We also see operant conditioning. So this is different, right? It's also known as instrumental learning. And Thorndike identified this in 1901. But the real father of operant conditioning is basically Skinner. He's known for his Skinner boxes in which he you know, would put pigeons and he would have them do these basic moves that within one, two, three repetitions, they would learn that if they pushed a certain level, they would get food. So this is based on the idea that behaviors are strengthened or weakened by their consequences. So what do you get by doing something? So operant conditioning depends on reinforcers, uh, good or bad, right? So um, in the terrible case of Jeannie, if she tried to talk to anybody, she was hit, right? Okay, so basically that's a big negative reinforcer so that it would keep her from speaking, right? But in other cases, remember we also talked about in class how kids are given stickers. So sometimes uh, a kid will put away his materials because he gets a sticker. So because of this reinforcer of the sticker or being hit, um, different people will react in different ways. So this gets to the idea of positive and negative, right? There is punishment, the negative that Jeannie experienced, or there's reinforcement for things that are positive. So both of those can have reinforcers. And this is a big question we have also in parenting. You know, should you punish or reinforce? Should you only take away uh, privileges or, or should you uh, prize positive things? This is a big question in behavior theory and a lot of parenting is based on, on the fundamentals of operant conditioning. Also in behavior theories is a social learning theory, and one of the main theorists here is Albert Bandura, in which it's determined that learning is a cognitive process which takes place in a social context, and it can occur through observation or direct instruction, even in the absence of motor reproduction or reinforcement. So here's where Bandura parted ways with Skinner, for example. He did not believe that you needed to have necessarily any kind of reinforcement in order to learn something. He believed that people could actually learn things simply by observing their environment. And there's uh, five basic characteristics of learning in Bandura's eyes. Learning is not purely behavioral, as Skinner and Pavlov had alluded to earlier, but rather it's a cognitive process that takes place in a social context. Uh, learning can occur by observing a behavior and by observing the consequences of the behavior, which is a type of reinforcement, but it's vicarious reinforcement. If you watch what happens to your brother or sister, you learn from that event even though you didn't receive the reinforcement yourself directly. And learning involves observation, extraction of information from those observations, and making decisions about the performance of the behavior. So this is observational learning or modeling that we see around us. And reinforcement plays a role in learning, but it is not entirely responsible for learning. So reinforcement can either be a physical reinforcer, as we talked about before in Skinner's example, 
or it can be something that you observe in others. It is important, but according to Bandura, it is not the be-all and end-all. Without you can still have learning without reinforcers. And finally, the learner is not a passive recipient of information. Cognition, environment, and behavior all mutually influence each other. So this is reciprocal determinism. So all of these things, your cognitive factors, your environmental factors, and the way you behave or, or react towards them, all mutually influence one another. Now if we move on to the cognitive theories, we have information theory, we have cognitive load theory, we have expertise theory, gestalt theory, and theory of mind. These are only a handful of examples. Obviously there's more uh, theorists that come underneath this, but we're just going to highlight a few of these. In information processing theory, um, this accounts for mental development in terms of maturation changes and basic components of a child's mind. So the idea is that um, humans process their world. It's not just they receive a stimulus from the outside world, as Aristotle thought, you know, this, through the senses you receive something, but that they actually have to process this information through different cognitive functions. So this is where this main idea came from by, um, that was stated first by Lachman in 1979 about, you know, the mind is a computer. So there's different sequential steps that must occur in exactly the same order for real learning to occur based on information processing. And this is based on the idea that cognitive processes emerge from different things like human language, thought, Im imagery, and different symbol systems. And the cognitive processes in question here are things like perception, recognition, imagination, uh, imaging, remembering, thinking, judging, reasoning, problem solving, conceptualizing, planning. And these are all, all of these distinct cognitive processes are always in development. It's not as, as we'll see in a second with Piaget's where conducted in different stages and you automatically move forward. But this, the idea here is an information processing theory is that you're continually refining these cognitive processes throughout your life. Another cognitive theory has to do with attribution theory. Um, this is, is also, in, in some categorization, seems um, a sub-area of Gestalt theory. Uh, this was funded by Heider in 1958, who was the father of attribution theory. We've got a lot of fathers here in psychology, right? And this is divided into two big areas, or two, two big groupings. First is external attribution, so situational attribution, what happens in the outside world. So this means interpreting someone's behavior as being caused by the situation that the individual is in. Um, this is not what I did to myself. This is, I had a flat tire because there was a hole in the road. Not because I'm a bad driver and ran into the hole, but because the road itself had damage to it. So this is, a, this is external attribution due to a situation external to me. But then there's also interpersonal attribution, which means interpreting motives or actions as being caused by others. So what happens by other people? What other people do is what influences the way I'm going to react or what I learn about the situation I'm in. This has uh, been highly criticized and probably rightly so because there's a lot of cultural biases. What is appropriate in one culture or another? Um, what is the level of personal responsibility in one culture or another? Since there's a strong cultural bias, this is one thing that has to be taken into consideration when somebody is using or thinking about integrating attribution theory into their own personal theory of learning. Another cognitive theory has to do with cognitive load. So basically, your brain gets full. This cartoon, I love this cartoon. Farside was great, right? Mr. Osborne, can, may I be excused? My brain is full. So what is cognitive load? It's the total amount of working memory effort that's needed in order to learn something. So instructional design can be used to reduce cognitive load and therefore ease learning processes. So now with better brain imaging, we understand the vital role that working memory plays in processing and helping us decide, do we keep this and goes into long-term memory, therefore I've learned it, or is this something that's lost? So working memory can either fade into nothing or can be the foundation of long-term memory. And there's a recognition here that instructional design, the way we structure our classes can improve cognitive load. Three basic um, types of cognitive load. There's intrinsic cognitive load, which is the effort associated with a specific topic uh, relative to other learning. For example, somebody might say, oh, I just find it's so much harder for me to do math than it is to do poetry. You know, relative to the other subject, um, I find that this is hard. So that's intrinsic cognitive load. And then there's extraneous load, which refers to the way information or tasks are presented to the learner. So the way methodologies are used. So some things might be 
You might think it's really hard, but the way it's taught makes it seem so easy. An extraneous cognitive load has to do with the way the information or tasks are presented to the learner. So you can reduce cognitive load with good methodology. And finally, germane cognitive load refers to the work put into the creation of a permanent store of knowledge or mental schema. This means when you change your mindset, when you change the way you think about something, or when you add to a mental schema. So if you've only known uh, poodles as being dogs, dogs your mental schema for, for dogs is just poodles, but then you expand it by seeing other things. Well, that is related to the germane cognitive load. How hard is it to, for you to expand your vision of what dogs could be? Dogs is pretty simple. However, when you think of other things, like what is your concept of freedom or what is your concept of equality? Other things require a higher level of cognitive load uh, in order to change. And what's fascinating is that we begin to now have things that have come out of psychology which are more measurable. Instead of just observation now, you can have mental measures of cognitive load by doing brain scans. In the cognitivist theories, there's also expertise theories. If you recall, we talked a bit about how many hours it takes for somebody to reach a level of expertise. And this comes from Erickson's uh, original work, which had to do with the accumulated amount of deliberate practice is closely related to the attained level of performance. So the more you rehearse something, the better you get at it. Well, this comes with this uh, controversial concept that perhaps there are some things that people might not be born gifted, but if they have enough practice, they might look like they're experts because they spent so much time on task. This has been shown in a lot of things that have to do with motor coordination, sometimes with music, but not necessarily all other types of fields. Cognitivist theories also include Gestalt theory, which has to do with uh, the mind sort of filling in the blanks, right? The mind seeks to create a unified whole out of disjointed parts. So the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, as Kafka said. And beyond just the visual sense of things, this has to do with making meaning out of a messy world. The way that we see things, we never see 100% complete uh, or we never receive 100% complete information. So this necessity to infer or to fill in gaps is really important. Uh, in the whole concept of psychology. So how do you understand or how do you learn about your world? Most of the time you're not going to have 100% information, so you will have to infer and to fill in gaps. So this was originally referred to as visual perception uh, and only uh, conducted or only discussed in this particular field. However, the Gestalt effect is now used in reference to the brain's ability to infer and fill in gaps of knowledge in general. Other cognitive theories have to do with stages of cognitive development. Remember we talked about Piaget's theory of cognitive development in the four stages. Uh, we're not going to go into depth here because you can watch the week four video based on that. And finally we round out cognitivist theories related to theory of mind. How do we think that others think about us and how does that in turn help us understand ourselves better. So one of the concepts in theory of mind is that I need to know the other in order to know myself. And this is based on the ability to attribute mental states to oneself and to others. Some of you might ask, well, how is that any different from emotional intelligence? And that's a very good question. How are they related? Having theory of mind implies that you have emotional intelligence, but also additional other perspective taking abilities. Theory of mind is also the ability to understand your own beliefs, intents, desires, and knowledge, not just emotional states. So can you measure theory of mind? There are three different ways that people propose you can actually uh, see theory of mind or it makes it visible. One is through the reciprocal social interaction as, as observation and joint attention. So when two different individuals are paying attention to the same thing, it means that they must be sharing the perspective taking, right? Um, also related to the functional use of language, how we interact, how we uh, react to one another, the fillers that we use, the specific words that are chosen have a lot to do with understanding the other's state. And finally, understanding others' emotions and actions, which is the piece of theory of mind which is closest to emotional intelligence. Then we have connectivist theories, and these have to do with anchored instruction, cognitive dissonance, communities of practice, situated learning, social development theory, and problem-based learning. When we think of anchored instruction, anchored instruction is grounded in a story or a narrative that presents a realistic but fictional situation and raises an overarching question or problem, which is then followed up with an essential question posed by the teacher. So kind of similar to problem-based learning, but this has to do with a fictional situation. So this approach is designed to engage the learner with a problem, um, so with a story, right? It requires the learner to develop goals, discover sub-goals related to this problem to solving the problem. It also provides the learner with extensive and diverse opportunities to explore 
uh, distinct problems. So the goal of anchored instruction is the engagement of intention and attention of the learner. Cognitive dissonance theory is mental distress, or it's a discomfort that one experiences uh, when you hold two different ideas that are contradictory in your mind. These can be different beliefs or ideas or values um, that have to be managed in your mind at the same time. You think, uh, Mr. Jones is my nice, friendly neighbor, but at the same time, then you see Mr. Jones um, beating his dog. So you're this creates cognitive dissonance. You always thought Mr. Jones was a nice guy, but what is he doing that's not very nice, right? So you have this clash of concepts in your mind. So in your mind, when you have one idea of a situation or one concept of Mr. Jones, and that is confronted with new information that conflicts those existing beliefs or ideas or values, then you have cognitive dissonance. And the idea that Festinger proposed uh, back in the 50s related to this concept is that humans are always looking for consistency and we're also looking for homeostasis. We're trying to get back to balance, right? So internal consistency would have to do with, can I put this square peg into this round hole? Can I keep Mr. Jones being the nice neighbor as he's beating his dog? Or do I have to change my understanding of that particular concept, that individual, that person? So similarly, you have this a lot with people who are addicted, right? You know, I am a smoker, but I know smoking causes cancer. So smoking is bad, but I like to do it. So how do you, that, that creates cognitive dissonance in your mind. So how do you break that in order to go beyond that and to learn a new behavior? So another theory of how humans learn has, has to do with communities of practice. Levin Wegner's work in the 1990s showed us that learning is central to identity and that social communities are vital to the construction of learning. Uh, very much like Bandura, uh, Bandura's first proposal that there's a social aspect to learning, these authors believe that without understanding your community of practice, you won't advance. So communities of practice are a group of people who share a profession or a common interest or a craft. And communities of practice can evolve naturally or deliberately. So that means that they can be something that I can plan, I can create this group of people, or they can evolve spontaneously. And they also can exist physically or virtually or even mobily. They don't have to be physical spaces. So we can have a community of practice in our virtual worlds. Our class can be considered a community of practice. We aren't in the same physical room. The overall objective of creating communities of practice is developing or, or structuring better social capital. And there's three interrelated terms related to communities of practice. One is that the communities of practice always include mutual engagement. First, uh, through members of the community, members establish norms, they build collaborative relationships, uh, and this is mutual engagement. They also must have a joint enterprise. Through their interactions, they create a shared understanding of what binds them together. Uh, this is termed a, a joint enterprise, and this, this is how academic societies also form, for example. And they also have a shared repertoire. That means, as part of practice, the communities produce a set of common resources. For example, a society might produce a journal. And this is termed their shared repertoire. This is used in pursuit of their joint enterprise and can include both literal and symbolic meaning. Very closely related to communities of practice is situated learning. Situated learning is a theory of how individuals acquire professional skills, extending research on apprenticeship into how legitimate peripheral participation leads to membership in a community of practice. So as a prerequisite to communities of practice, you have to be able to have or construct situated learning. Situated learning takes as its focus the relationship between learning and the social situation in which it occurs. There's a very big emphasis in situated learning on the, the link between knowing how to do it and doing something, and the importance of context and authentic learning. So this is a precursor to authentic learning situation. So content, context, community, and participation are vital to structuring situated learning experiences. And they are full of formative assessments. So there's new learning along the way and formative assessment offered by the members of the group. Social development theory is also born of this group. Applicable universally this means that it's social development theory can be found in all cultures. It's focused on the idea that humans, not the materials, drive the development of a country, for example. And so improving the levels of energy, efficiency, quality, productivity, complexity, comprehension, creativity, mastery, uh, enjoying and accomplishment. The focus of social development theory is the good of the group, right? The good of the whole society based on the learning of the individuals. Social development theory highly values the pioneer and imitation of the pioneer. So people who are outliers, people who do things slightly differently are valued in social development theory. 
uh, people who sort of push the borders of our understanding at the moment. Uh, you would say that social development theory would love people like Steve Jobs, for example. In social development theory, it means that educational systems serve to propagate values and development goals of the particular society, whatever they may be. And development is enhanced by individual awareness of the opportunities to improve and grow. So one of the main roles of school then is to create or promote a society. So, this, so if you um, believe in social development theory, you believe that the purpose of schooling is to help improve and develop society as, as well as the individual. Finally, problem-based learning has its origins in medicine. This is, it was very popular to lay out a real-life problem without a solution yet and, and, and have it resolved by the group. Um, it uses open-ended problems, problems that don't have resolution yet, to refine thinking strategies and to understand or to clarify domain area knowledge. So we know something about blood. Okay, what do we know about blood clotting? Okay, how do we act to this particular problem this person's blood doesn't clot, right? Um, so the domain area knowledge is refined. It also develops flexible thinking, flexible knowledge. How do you react to slightly different cases that might have the same origins or the same root causes? It helps refine effective problem-solving skills. It, it is very much based on self-directed learning. So the problem is chosen by the teacher, but the students themselves self-direct in finding their solutions. It's heavily dependent on good collaboration, on intrinsic motivation, and work in groups. And this is related to cognitive load theory. And remember we talked about the germane aspects of cognitive load. Uh, when you have higher order thinking going on uh, and you select problem-based learning, you can reduce the cognitive load of the individual because you're doing very difficult levels of conceptual thinking but this type of methodology lends itself to reducing cognitive load and therefore enhancing the probability of real learning. So now if we look at design-based theories, these have a lot to do with computer or technology-assisted learning. So there's elaboration theory, there's ADDIE, there's learner-centered design, there's multimodality, and there's digital citizenship as well as the concept of gaming and gaming motivation online collaborative learning, as well as online disinhibition effects. ADDIE has to do with uh, analyzing a situation, designing a solution, developing the, the tool needed for that, implementing this, and then evaluating it. So this is a model of instructional design, it's, and what is key in this is the order of steps. This was developed in the 1970s, basically for the military, but the idea was a process involved in formulation of instructional systems development in order to train individuals to do a particular job. So they had to learn how to analyze the situation, design a solution, develop the tools necessary, implement this, and then evaluate. Elaboration theory is also known as scaffolded instruction. It was promoted by Regulus in the 1970s. It has to do with chunking information into smaller parts um, to reach different learning goals. So there's a sequence from simple to complex, and it's based on su students synthesizing and summarizing abilities after each lesson or each unit. The idea is to enhance retention, and we know that memory is vital to learning, so this in, uh, improves the, the possibility of retaining information. This has to do with content area knowledge as well as processes or task expertise. Learner-centered design is an attempt to improve individualized learning. It considers learning while doing, supports learners in ways of using the software throughout the use of it. Again, learner-centered does not necessarily have to be based on technology, but in this particular grouping of these theories, it does have to do with how do you leverage technology, but not let technology dominate, but rather the learner's own needs take precedence. Then there's multimodality theories, and this is a design-based idea that initially meant just changing the person or the methodology that was being used. And it was originally focused on in language learning classes, so whether or not you used a tape recording or you listened to other people or you changed activities. Now we see this uh, multimodality concept in all different uh, fields or all different domains of learning, as well as being complemented by new technologies that can enhance the learning. So the concept here is that you need to put information into your mind or your brain into in various pathways in order to facilitate retrieval. So by doing this in different mod modalities, you're able to enhance the probability of recall. Gaming theory, or gaming that's based on a motivational theory, was born of the onset of technology, right? And it takes advantage of different reward systems in the brain. The dopaminogenic loop, the e-learning theory, games reward system, game gamification and education, these are all similar names for the basic concept of personalizing learning by using algorithms to modify the level of difficulty to the individual learner. The idea here is, in these structures, the games never let the person lose too much because they get discouraged, and they never let them win too much because they'll get bored. So the idea is to adjust learning difficulties to the individual.
Related to media and technology theories, we have online collaborative learning theory. So if you recall, we have these social learning theories. Well, here, the idea of collaboration um, being enhanced by being in an online environment is the focus of this particular learning theory. This can be done in formal and informal settings, and that means in school or out of school. It can be spontaneous or it can be structured, um, something that somebody designs um, purposefully, or it can be pe groups of people that come together spontaneously. But this is a technology-dependent learning process in which different tools and platforms correlate with different types of success and different structures of collaboration. So you, we could say that in our particular classroom we have an online collaborative learning structure that's designed through the discussion boards, for example. This leads to high levels of collaboration and increased probability of satisfaction by the individual learners so long as there are clear expectations and clear priorities in, at the beginning of the course. What are we using this particular tool or this particular technology tool for? What should it lead to? Then we have a very interesting, uh, fascinating concept in psychology which has to do with inhibition or disinhibition. The idea that online learning leads to disinhibition, that means that there's a loosening or a complete abandonment of social restrictions and inhibitions that would normally be present in face-to-face -face interactions. People share things about themselves, people um, offer to help or they offer advice. Uh, in ways that they might never do in face-to-face -face situations. And this leads to a general liberation of an individual, permitting him to learn even faster. So now we look at 21st century skills. And 21st century skills are focused on the idea of soft skills. This has to do with the ability to collaborate, communicate, care for others, to think critically, to be culturally sensitive. It also has a heavy dose of technology added to it. And the greater goal of becoming a lifelong lover of learning. When we look at 21st century skills, there's been a lot of research done on this by the OECD nations, for example, in understanding what are the competencies that are related to learners in the new millennium. Some of the key authors here are Willingham, Belanca, Dade, and um, the publication by the OECD. What is interesting in the uh, criticism here is that many of these soft skills that are mentioned here before are things that Many employers say that they wish their employees could do better. They say, well, I'd hire this person, but they don't know how to communicate very well. Or I'd hire this person, they don't seem to really care for their uh, community uh, of learners. Or I'd hire this person, but they're not very culturally sensitive. So these are things that are not explicitly taught in most curriculum structures, um, but they are things that are highly valued by em employers in modern society. Finally, we have constructivist theories, and constructivist theories we've spoken about a bit. We talk about Dewey, and we've talked about Montessori, and we've talked about Piaget, Vygotsky, uh, Bruner, and kind of, we've talked about some of these individuals in prior weeks when we talked about ages and stages of development. But all of these individuals have in common this idea that you construct learning. An individual constructs his own understanding of the world based on prior knowledge or prior information. So Dewey was one of these big constructivists. So was Montessori, Piaget, Vygotsky, uh, Bruner, and Glasserfeld. And we'll just look at them very briefly to understand their differences. Um, Dewey was an American philosopher turned psychologist and educator. He considered himself a pragmatist and he did functional psychology and uh, looked towards very progressive ideas in education. And he believed firmly in democracy and he believed that the goal of humanity was to achieve a perfected uh, democ democratic society. And he believed very heavily that schools and civil society contributed to that ultimate goal. So the ultimate goal of the school then is, is that it's a social institution through which reform can take root in education and learning are social interactive processes. Montessori was an Italian physician. She was a medical doctor first and she was inspired by the work of Froebel who we introduced when we talked about kindergarten, remember that, and Pestalozzi and the greater use of sensory exploration and use of manipulatives. Her original work were with children who had learning difficulties, but then it spread to being very popular and many institutions around the world apply her philosophy. She believed um, heavily in documentation and noting down information, very much in the, in the line of thinking that Piaget would do. He, she believed in documenting and making choices, a decision based on scientific observation. She called her method uh, practical play. She had three different groupings of students, these two and a half year olds and then the two and a half year olds to six years old six-year-olds and then six to twelve-year-olds and there was a belief there that by acknowledging all children as individuals and treating them as such 
that would yield better learning and fulfilled potential of each particular child. So the idea would be that if you have individuality of the, of the child, that would be the motivation in and of itself that the child would want to succeed and would learn. Very clear in her methodology is this goal towards autonomy, where the individual child is motivated. So the motivation in children is sparked by self-directed activity, although these were highly structured in her uh, model. There's great respect for the individual. And there was a greater use of ergonomics or, or using uh, furniture and, um, and materials that were child size. So child size desks or desks or toilets and the ability to move freely between um, different learning spaces. And she based her work on practical activities in the, which were focused on the care of the self, on their environment. And, and her original curriculum was um, structured very much around a balance between the body, the mind, intellect and, and religion. Piaget is probably one of the most well-known constructivist theorists that we have, and he was a Swiss developmental psychologist. He, he also was grounded in philosophy, and he called himself a genetic epistemologist. Uh, and he believed that only education is capable of saving our societies from possible collapse, whether violent or gradual. So uh, again, he's one of these people who truly believed in the great power of education, or formal education, to instigate good or bad, or positive or negative change in society. He is considered the first constructivist, and he, as well as Montessori, they took a semi-clinical perspective on children. He had an, an interview technique with children in which he would, he would start off with a very formal question, but then he would let children lead the discussion so that he could observe their interactions and reactions to the questions that he would pose to them. He believed that a person's intellectual development is the extension of the biological evolutionary adaptation of the individual to the environment. So collectively, so this idea then of of looking at this epigenetic perspective um, was born of Piaget's observational work. And he believed that learning was really the formation or changes in mental schema that one would have. And he believed firmly that learning, the definition of learning, was actually the formation or the change of mental schema that one had in their mind. And this was, um, this was achieved either through assimilation or accommodation. Vygotsky, a counterpart of Piaget, was a Russian psychologist. Um, he looked at developmental and cultural historical psychology. And he believed that higher cognitive functions emerge, emerge from practical activities in social environments. And he also believed that reasoning was mediated by symbols, culture, language, and universal cognitive processes. And as we mentioned in week four, um, he was very well known for, for his beliefs about the relationship between thought and language. He developed this concept of the zone of proximal development and he highly prized the psychology of play and the importance of play in learning. Jerome Brunner, um, one of the few constructivists or original constructivists that's still alive today, he's an American psychologist. He does cognitive and educational psychology. He now works in the Faculty of Law in New York. He was a pioneer in cognitive psychology. And he believed that sensation and perception are active processes rather than passive. It's not that just sensation happens to you, but he believes that this is mediated by your own individual interpretation of those particular senses. And he advocated a holistic understanding of the mind and all different cognitions. Uh, he didn't believe uh, in artificial uh, intelligence because he believed that this was a, an entirely dynamic process that an individual would have to reconstruct over and over again. He coined a term that was called instructional scaffolding, even though um, this existed in Vygotsky's work earlier, but it probably wasn't translated um, quick enough. But this is based on the belief that a learner is capable of learning any material so long as the instruction is organized appropriately. So this has to do with the order of introduction of different concepts was more important than, uh, than the age of the individual. And he also believed in, an, in, a, in models of learning that were not uh, conducted in specific stages. They were dynamic processes that might happen in parallel. And these three basic models had to do with inactive representation, which was action-based, or iconic representation, which is image-based, or symbolic representation, which is language-based learning. And finally, von Glasserfeld is a constructivist who was a German philosopher, he was a psychologist, and he coined a term that was called radical constructivism. Now, how did radical constructivism differ from basic constructivism? And he, thought, he believed then it's up to the individual to link up specific interpretations of experiences and ideas with their own references of what is possible and viable. That is, the process of constructing knowledge of understanding is dependent on the individual's subjective interpretation of their active experience, and not exactly on what really occurs. 
And with that, we round out the constructivists. Now let's look at some new theories of learning that have just occurred over the past few years. And these have to do with some concepts that we've already talked about in class. Experience and sleep-dependent plasticity, neuroconstructivism, the creation of networks in the brain, and two new ideas I'd like to throw out there for your review. One is called the five pillars, and the other has to do with the structure of our current class. So we talked briefly, uh, we talked about this in week two and week three, uh, related to experience and sleep-dependent plasticity. We understand that you are born with a genetic makeup and your genes interact with the environment to create new learning. But you have to have the stimulation of the environment in order to activate or to turn on certain genetic codes that you might have. And we also consider the idea that there is sleep-dependent plasticity. Without sleep, there is no consolidation of long-term memory. And if you don't have memory, you don't have learning. So this first big idea, or this new idea of how does learning occur, has to do with all the complex processes of what happens in your daily life, your interaction with your environment based on your genetic p potential. But then in addition to that, you have to have other things. Obviously, you have to have good brain architecture based on good um, nutrition. You have to have a balance in your life, body, mind, balance. But the biggest key here has to do with sleep-dependent plasticity. Without sleep, there can be no consolidation of memory and therefore no learning. And the results of this, if this is successful, then the core learning and behavioral change, brain changes occur before behavioral changes occur, which is why we haven't seen this in other theories beforehand. Now we can actually see that there are changes in the physiology of the brain when there's new learning that occurs. And the brain can change at any age for good or bad, so plasticity throughout the lifespan. And the brain is altered by a wide range of experiences, and different individuals will react to those different experiences in different ways based on their genetic makeup. And early events, early childhood events, do make a difference. A neuronal plasticity varies with age. There is a declination after a certain time and higher levels of plasticity in the early years. There's an infinite number of individualized experiences with infinite possibilities of performance, and this is all based on the, the uniqueness of the individual. And that lifelong neuroplasticity has major consequences for brain health and fitness. It enables us to prevent future decline and provide support for enhancing rehabilitation and habilitation, which means that if we can look at better protective factors, we can enhance plasticity throughout the lifespan. The second big idea, our new idea here, has to do with neuroconstructivism, which we've also introduced briefly in previous weeks. What is a theory? Neuroconstructivism is a theoretical framework focusing on the construction of representation in the developing brain. Cognitive development is explained as emerging from the experience-dependent development of neural structures supporting mental representations. So now we've moved from psychology now into neurology, where you can actually see physiological changes in the brain that substantiate the concept of constructivism. This is a mixture of what happens when your genetic activity and your environment and all the different changes that will happen in between based on the activation of, of your genetic code based on the environment you're living in. The third big idea here has to do with networks. And we mentioned briefly, you know, how does your brain learn? So are there networks, for example, for math? We know that there are networks for math in the brain related to a triple code system. Your brain stores the number three written in Arabic uh, in a different place, and it stores the word, uh, the word three written in letters, or a symbol of three. We also know that mental processing occurs in a different neural network than does magnitude estimation, which is also different from numerical cognition, which is also different from multiplication or figural or, or spatial manipulation. And when combined, we find that there's multiple neural networks in the brain that lead to this ability to do math. Very similarly, you can find multiple networks in the brain related to language networks. There are, there's a letterbox or a word form area in the brain that processes specific words. When your brain learns a new word, uh, it actually activates other types of areas of the brain. You have to be able to perceive the word. You have to have a phonemic understanding of the word. You have to look for a semantic memory of the word. So there's a very complex process just in learning a single word. And reading in the brain involves even more additional pathways or neural networks in the brain. There's also a different network related to sentence comprehension, which involves all of these different areas of the brain. Semantic retrieval, this is this tip of the tongue phenomenon where you're looking for the word that you know that you already know from, past, from the past, but you can't find it. Uh, there's different networks related to overall language processing in the brain. And there's, uh, there are different codes related to passive reading of active words, as, and, it, and those are different from the active reading of passive words. <laughs> Additionally, there are networks related to spelling, which are different from the networks that are related to humor interpretation, which are different from the networks related to first and second languages. There is an area of overlap, but they are distinct neural pathways. 
which is also different from the pathways related to intonation or prosody, um, or networks that are related to language that have to do with gesture and meaning. So all of these different complex networks are another way that we could say this is the theory of learning. We believe that networks in the brain are the way humans learn. A fourth new concept that uh, we could consider about how the brain learns has to do with the five pillars. And this is based on the neuroconstructivist idea of how new information builds in the brain, but it's also based on Bruner's spiral concept that new simplistic information is then added upon in order to reach higher orders of understanding. And the reason this is called five pillars is that there are five different ways that the brain is categorizing information. There are symbol systems in the brain, patterns in the brain, a concept of order, categories, and relations. And what's very interesting to look at when you look at brain scans, when you look at things that are related to symbol systems, there is evidence of a hierarchy of different symbol systems. Similarly, there's a hierarchy to pattern recognitions, and there is a hierarchy for order cognition, as well as for categories and relations. For example, uh, if, when a child is learning to add, if you're looking at two plus three equals five, that's heavily based on symbols, understanding the symbolic representation of the concept of two, uh, this idea of plus, right? And it's also heavily dependent on order. If I were to switch these things around, if I were to write two plus five, that does not equal three, right? So the order is also very important there. Or if I teach a child how to read a sentence, the child has to read the symbolic understanding, also has to have the order, but they'll understand the basic pattern of subject, verb, object, for example, as they read. Or something even, uh, something more complex, negotiating an agreement. There are different patterns of human interaction that exist or relationships that have to be leveraged in order for negotiations to occur. So the idea here is that there's nothing that you learn that is not either a symbol, a pattern, an order, a category, or a relation. And this has to do with the broad definition of these categories. We look at symbols as being forms, shapes, representations. We look at patterns as being anything that's a series, or rules, or regularity, or chronology. We consider order to be things that have to do with sequence, cycles, processes, operations, symptom, systems thinking. Categories are qualities or equivalencies, and relations have to do with anything that's a proportion or correspondence or approximation, estimation, magnitude, measure, quantity, space, or context. So just about anything you can learn can fit into. I have been plotting so far uh, math and language, and there's nothing that you learn in math and language that doesn't fit into these things. I've expanded this to try to look into other uh, curriculum-based subjects like science or art, um, as well as outside of formal learning contexts, and with a stretch of the imagination or with this broader definition of terms, there's nothing that you learn that is not either a symbol, pattern, order, category, and or a relation. The idea, the implications of this is if this is how humans really learn, if this is the neuroconstructivist way that things are stacked in our brain, this has huge implications for curriculum. So instead of learning subjects like math, language, social science, arts, uh, physical education, you would learn symbols. So all the symbols that you find in language, math, social science, art, science, and physical education, you do learn symbols, a hierarchy of symbols, and patterns, and order, and categories, and relations, as opposed to separated by, by subject areas. This is a huge paradigm shift in thinking. The amount of problems it relieves is tremendous. You wouldn't fight over you know, how many hours math gets as opposed to art in the curriculum because it would all be meshed together. You wouldn't have to encourage uh, transdisciplinary thinking because automatically it would be part of the way we teach. Anyways, it's an idea I throw out there. If you're interested, the Pillars paper is in the course room. Announcement section, I'd love to have feedback on the idea. Finally, the last idea here is to propose a very interesting concept, or it's rather, and, and, and as always in this class, in the form of a question, I'd like to ask you if you think that a modality of learning can actually be a theory of learning. What do we mean by this? Remember, uh, at the, we talked about the possibilities in the course, you know, there's a, you can have this quiz that you take at the beginning of the topic that we cover in order to hook you and to test your baseline knowledge and stimulate prior understanding of the basic concepts that we're going to cover. And then you have a weekly video that goes over the basic concepts, concepts, terminology, processes, theories. Then we give you a bundle, and the bundle allows you to read widely or to watch videos and have a deeper understanding of the content, as well as to read contrasting viewpoints of the information. Then we have discussion boards in which you teach and learn from others. 
the live class situation in which we look for authentic applications of the information to extend the knowledge into and transfer it into real life context for you. Then we have sections in which we go into depth into a deeper area or a specific area of the information. And then we have the three to one quizzes that follow the sections and live classes, which ask you to synthesize your understanding. What did you learn? What are you going to keep researching? What are you going to change based on the information that you have? And this compares your baseline knowledge and helps you see advances in your own learning. And finally, we've introduced now the semester project. And the semester project is meant to help you learn how to learn. It's to understand a process of how to do research. And it's to create autonomy so that you can continue to go deeper into specific areas of personal interest to you. We provide a space for virtual meeting rooms so that you can meet up with your fellow classmates in this context. And we, and we work on your improved uh, research skills so that you can become lifelong independent learners. This creates the ultimate goal of autonomy. So this is based on a model in which we elicit prior knowledge, we engage you, there's exploration of the concepts on your part, you try to explain what you're learning, and we come in and to elaborate a little bit when necessary to clarify vocabulary and processes. Then we have evaluation and then we challenge you to extend the information beyond the particular example that you have in your classroom. So this created a lot of possibilities. So this fits into this course on the neuroscience of learning because we're actually looking at many learning theories that come into play within our classrooms. So the bottom line is that we're looking at the Greeks, you know, the love of wisdom. We also believe that this is very much grounded in Rousseau's idea that education should be shaped by the learner and that there's a priori knowledge, um, as Kant said, you know, based on your genetic makeup. We also think this is grounded in humanist theories of learning because of uh, emotional intelligence, ex experiential learning, as well as positive psychology. And we also think that there's a modified behavioralism here. There's a conditioning based on firing and wiring and the social learning theory that are attached there. Cognitism comes into play related to information processing and cognitive load and theory of mind. And there's connectivism here as well, Connective, uh, the cognitive dissonance we hope that you're enjoying as you change your mental scheme or your ideas about different uh, or preconceived notions about learning, as well as the development, development of our community of practice. And then there's design-based uh, learning, which has to do with the multimodality that we try to incorporate in the classroom, the learner-centered focus, the online collaborative, and disinhibition effect. We see that this is also enhancing 21st century soft skills, especially in the communication area and technology. So it's also based in constructivism and, and what I joked about earlier, you know, Socrates meets Montessori, uh, and using Bruner's spiral uh, repetition of information. All of this can be used to enhance academic as well as vocational skills, as well as life skills. We hope that this kind of a structure is adding not only to professional but personal betterment. And we look at this through the modern lens as well as presuming that there's, that there's experience in sleep-dependent plasticity that is uh, consolidating your learning, that it's based on neuroconstructivism, and these are forming neural networks in your brain. So, so with that, I'd like to make the case that the way that we've structured the course, at least, I don't know if it's its own theory of learning, but it's very much grounded in multiple theories that have come before it. So now if we look in summary, what did we do? We looked at the philosophy basis of learnings, the Greeks, the Romans, the church, and mosque influences, the Renaissance, Enlightenment, and we looked at several traditional theories of learning, humanist theories, behaviorist theories, cognitivist theories, connectivist theories, design-based theories, 21st century skills, and constructivist theories, and then we looked at some new theories, neuroconstructivism, uh, neural networks, the five pillars, and we talked about how our class is trying to uh, incorporate all of these things. What we want to challenge you now is to uh, come up with your own theory. What is it that you think is happening how does the human brain learn? Uh, and that is your next assignment. Good luck with that. As always, do your three, two, one. Three, three things you didn't know before this class started. Two things that are so interesting you're going to keep researching them, or you're going to keep, or you're going to tell someone else. And one thing that you're going to change about your personal professional practice. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thanks. See you next week.